Let's talk about the real United Nations. And the mounting propaganda for international controls, international peace, and international currency. The retention of the sovereignty of the United States of America and other independent nations around the world may depend upon what you and I and others do in the months ahead. I would like to think of our program tonight as being in true Western style, a six-gun attack on the shaky foundations of the international organization we call the United Nations. I would like to think of each chamber in that six-gun being filled with additional facts for you. Our distinguished speakers will supply that ammunition in terms of the origin, the morals, the finance, the crimes, the composition, and the purpose of the United Nations. If that six-gun is properly pointed and properly used, it can be a devastating blow to those who would see a world, a world in which we live totally subjugated to a tyrannical new order run by an elite few. Our first speaker this evening might be introduced with the phrases, Anarchy USA, More Deadly Than War, The Grand Design, and This is the John Birch Society. He is probably the most familiar face of a variety of spokesmen who have presented the conservative viewpoint on the screen. But his credentials extend far beyond his film credits. His definitive study of the weaknesses and the dangers of the United Nations in his first book, The Fearful Master, certainly qualify him to speak authoritatively to us tonight. His speaking career began at the early age of 15 when he won a nationwide oratorical contest speaking about a man whose name has become synonymous with patriotism, Patrick Henry. While still in high school, he became master of ceremonies of his own network radio program. That ability, which became evident so early in our speaker's life, has been polished and refined to the point all of us are very proud to have him as a spokesman. To begin our analysis of the United Nations, it is vital to explore the origins of the international organization, determine its roots and those who planted and nurtured the seeds. There is no man more qualified to explore these recesses of muted history than the man I now introduce, speaking on the origins of the United Nations Mr. G. Edward Griffin. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As you've already been advised, the book called The Fearful Master, A Second Look at the United Nations, was completed in 1964. And at that time, I listed 17 men who, according to my research at that time, were responsible for creating the United Nations on behalf of the United States government. These were the men who were employed by our government on the federal payroll, in the State Department, in the Treasury Department to a lesser extent, but all in the executive branch of government. The men who hammered into shape the policies that later became part of the Charter of the United Nations. Those names were taken primarily from, from government documents put out by the State Department. Now, I said at that time that of those 17 men, all but one had later been identified under oath as members of the Communist Party at the very time they were creating the United Nations for us. Well, since 1964, I've had reason to believe that that count of 17 was perhaps a premature count. I think it's probably unwise to nail down any hard and fast figure, because after all, it's almost impossible to say that this man was instrumental in creating the United Nations policies, but that man was not 
where do you draw the line? There's shades of influence. If I were to make a list today, I think I would put it at 35. I have since run across lists of names that, which, in my opinion, you would say that these men were certainly instrumental in the creation of the United Nations. But take your pick, 17 or 35. Here is what you come up with. Out of the 35, the larger figure, let's say, 13 were clearly identified as members of the Communist Party. 21 were members of the Council on Foreign Relations, and three were both communists and members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, I'm sure in this audience there are very few people who are not aware of what the CFR is. For those of you who are not aware, or for those of you who are listening to the recordings of this meeting, and you don't know what the CFR is, I suggest you have a little homework to do. And uh, there are many books being offered by the John Birch Society which can help you with your home studies. The most important, of course, is Gary Allen's excellent little book, None Dare Call It Conspiracy. But whether you call it the Communist Party or the Communist Party in conjunction with the CFR, it all comes out the same because the objectives of these two organizations are essentially the same world government under totalitarian control. Now, after the creation of the UN, after the first few years, we find that the evidence of communist penetration into the American quota to the, to the United Nations Secretariat was quite overwhelming. For instance, in 1952, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee published these hearings. It's quite a thick document. This is the testimony of high-ranking American employees at the United Nations. For those of you who would like to try and dig this old hearing out of the library, the title of it is Activities of United States Citizens Employed by the United Nations. What did this committee find, ladies and gentlemen? On page 181, here is what they found. Quote, Extensive evidence indicating that there is today in the United Nations, among the American employees there, the greatest concentration of communists that this committee has ever encountered." End quote. And when you realize what committee is speaking here, this is the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. And then when you realize the concentration of communists that that committee has encountered, and then recognize that they are saying this was the greatest concentration of all, you can imagine what these hearings uncovered. Of course, the defenders of the United Nations will tell you that things are better now. Things are always better now than they were yesterday, for some reason, to hear these people. Well, when did they get better? I'd like to give you just an idea of how and when they got better. Eleven of the worst offenders whose cases were brought out in these hearings became identified in the American press at that time as the Red Eleven. These were just the worst of the bunch. Because of the controversy, these people were suspended temporarily from their jobs at the UN pending further investigation. And then, after the elections in the United States, after the elections in which the primary candidate for president of the United States promised to do something about this deplorable situation of communist penetration into the State Department and into the United Nations quota, then after the elections and the smoke died down and everyone went back to sleep, confident that now that they elected this man, something surely would be done, here's what happened. All 11 of these men were either rehired at the UN, got their jobs back with back pay, or if they so chose, they were given cash indemnities, some of them as high as $40,000 each. That's how things got better. And from that time forward, there has been no clean out, no investigation, as a matter of fact, of even the possibility of further penetration into the American quota at the UN. Now you can imagine if the conditions are even potentially that bad in the United States quota, imagine what they must be like among the quota to the UN from so many of the other nations around the world that don't even go through the motions of pretending to be anti-communist, such as Tanzania, Ghana, Egypt, the United Arab Republic, and many, many others that you could name. 
On December 12, 1952, still ancient history, U.S. News and World Report said as follows, quote, U.S. authorities have no power to dig into the backgrounds of U.N. employees from other nations, although they have information indicating heavy communist infiltration among those employees. An informed estimate suggests that as many as one-half of the administrative executives in the U.N. are either communists or people who are willing to do what they want." End quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that was way back in 1952, and need I remind you that communist influence and penetration in the countries around the world has not grown less. It has not diminished since 1952, but in fact has grown stronger. So what effect does all this have on the actions of the United Nations and especially on the morality of the United Nations? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the subject of your next speaker. Thank you.